should collect this under school offering for you. Everybody else is trying to steal a bra. I need to hold on to it as much as I can. Well, good morning, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Pastor, pray that we go by faith and not facts. Well, unfortunately, I'm going to go against the pastor today because we're going to look at facts that prove our faith. <coughs> because we're going to spend this week and next week looking at facts proving the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How do we know that Jesus Christ really lived? How do we know that he really died? And what proof is there? Can we point people to the proof that Jesus Christ was a real man who lived and really died, but he also really resurrected again. He came back from the dead and did the impossible. I know we weren't here for the last two weeks, but we've been looking at this to a degree because we began looking at... I have to go back to my notes real quick. I know what we taught last. Prophecy. We looked at prophecy and proving the resurrection. We started with the Word of God, the infallible Word of God. No matter how much man has tried to prove the Bible wrong in the past, they still not have not been able to do it. But rather, the ones that have been earnest and diligent in attempting to prove the Bible wrong have found the latter that the Bible is actually 100% true. It's not contradictory, and it's not false. So we looked at prophecy and looked at um, how Christ fulfilled several prophecies and the fact that one man fulfilling just eight of these prophecies is like putting a man in Texas after Texas has been covered with about three feet of quarters, one quarter marked, tossed in the shuffle, mixed all around, blindfolding that man, and then saying, find that one quarter. That is the odds of just one of these prophecies being fulfilled, uh, just eight of these prophecies being fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Then we looked at how the Bible points to Jesus Christ as the becoming Messiah. And we didn't look at it through prophecy, but rather we looked at it through type and shadows. We know, according to the Word of God, that the tabernacle was a shadow of things to come. Those religious ceremonies, all those things were quote-unquote shadows. And what do shadows do? They point to the actual object, to the actual thing. If you're standing outside in the sun, they actually point to you because your shadow is reflecting off your body. It's a cast image. And that's what these things did when it comes to Jesus Christ. They were a shadow of him and that pointed and directed us to him through the sacrificial lamb, through the Passover lamb. Now today we're going to go on and we're going to have a big open discussion that I told everyone to prepare for. But we're going to see, how can we prove that Jesus Christ actually existed? If we are going to look at it historically, which is what we're doing today, looking at the resurrection through historical accounts, how do you think that we can prove that Jesus Christ actually existed? Well, for one period, 500 have seen him at one time. So if we back that up a little bit, what we're looking at are primary eyewitnesses. Basically, how do we know that you were in church today? Well, there were witnesses. Sister Beth was here, I was here, Brother Eli was here, you two are here. So we all have a witness or a testimony that they were here at this point, and we can confirm that. There's no denying it. And it's not just one person's word, but we can go back and go to at least four other people and say, yeah, we can all verify that so-and-so was here today. We don't have to get on Facebook, but we look at who was actually there. And when we look at the life of Christ, that's exactly what we're looking at. So according to you, Brother Eli, and we're going to be bouncing around my notes a little bit. Would someone please find 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 6. 1 Corinthians 15, 6.
1 Corinthians 15 and verse 6. So we have proof that Jesus Christ actually existed. 500 people can testify that Jesus Christ actually existed. But is there something else that's more phenomenal in this verse that it's referring to? And of course we'd have to back up quite a bit, but I'm just, and we'll talk about it later too. But. When did they witness Jesus Christ? After his resurrection. So it's not just enough to say, hey, that this person actually lived. But we are looking at 500 people that can actually go, yep, I saw him die on Galgalva. I know he was dead. But this is Jesus Christ and he is alive again. So we have proved by 500, by the witness of 500, that not only did Jesus Christ actually live, but he actually resurrected from the dead again. So if we're looking at eyewitness accounts, and that's exactly where we were going, it's not just enough to say that so-and-so existed, because how do we know that Jesus didn't have a twin? So if, so what does that tell us? We need to get a little bit closer to the subject at hand. A little, a little bit closer to the person that we're studying. Somebody that might know him in a personal way and might have wrote about him or known him or been able to testify about him. And if we wanted to prove that Jesus Christ actually existed and was who he said he was, where would we go? We have four of the Gospels wrote about him. Four of the Gospels wrote about him. How many of, the, of those Gospels actually interacted with Jesus on a very close level? Three. Very good, brother. And do you remember, I won't use that whiteboard, but do you remember who they were? Matthew, Mark, John. Very good, brother. Matthew, Mark, and John. John. And John. So we have, can trace and historically prove that Jesus Christ actually existed because people li living during his time not only just wrote about him, but they were close to him. They knew him in a personal way. In fact, when we get to the inner circle of Jesus, John was right there. So not only do we have somebody in the group, but we have John who is on the inside, someone who maybe Jesus told all his secrets to. When he tried to explain things to the Gentiles, not to the Gentiles, but to his followers, including his 12, and he tried to tell them things, and you almost get the idea that Jesus goes, can't get anything through to him, brother. You're like, I try to break it down, and they don't understand yet. But then he takes these three aside and says, look, this is what it is. And he just tells them right now. And that's what we know as, know as the inner circle of Jesus Christ. So, now we need to get fact that, get proof that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were truly on the inner circle or in their sanctum or knew Jesus Christ in a personal way historically. Can we trace that historically? And the answer is yes. Yes, we can trace it, Jesus, that these three gospel writers were in the inner circle of Christ when I say inner circle within the twelve at this point. I realize I'll get confusing because there was an inner inner circle, yeah. But Yes, Luke, not John. Okay, at this point, listen to Brother Eli. John, not Luke. Matthew, Mark, John. They were the three followers of Jesus Christ. And we start with Matthew and the writing of his letters, because this is the other thing that's phenomenal about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, it is the inspired word of God, but if we have to, we can use it to prove historically as a historical document, that these are the primary witnesses of Jesus Christ. And this is how we do that. Now, normally if somebody wants to prove something's false, 
It'll be written about maybe hundreds of years later. I think, uh, what was it, Homer, when he wrote about Troy, it was actually written several hundred years after Troy actually happened. But when we look at the gospel narratives, especially if they were going to pull off a hoax, they're writing about it in their own time, and they're writing about it shortly after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're not wasting any time. When we look at the four Gospels, which are biographies of Jesus Christ, specifically focusing on Matthew, Mark, and John at this point, we know that the Gospel of Matthew was written about 40 A.D., no later than 50 A.D. When did Jesus Christ die and rather from the dead? Roughly... And you didn't write the book, right? I had a Bible school teacher that did that one time. Every time he would preach the word of God, I didn't write the book. This is what God said. Well, one time we were sitting in class, and I asked him a question about the throne room of heaven, and he made some comment about it, and about where the altar was. I said, I don't know. I didn't design the place. But if we're getting back to the subject at hand, the four Gospels, Matthew was written no later than 40 A.D., Oh, no later than 50 AD, probably around 40 AD. If Jesus Christ, when we look at the big scope of things, what's one big thing that Jesus divided for all mankind that we all go by? And not the veil of the curtain, not the veil of the temple. Something that's not physical. Which is? He died for all of us. What? He died for all of us. He died for all of us, but there's something that he actually that we base upon him solely upon him it's not something tangible nope not that spiritual brother completely unspiritual something that god is not bound by i'm bound by i have to stop in 30 minutes but time jesus christ we divide time by Jesus Christ. Because we have BC, which is before Christ, and AD, which is something like Adenus in the year about a Lord, I believe, which is after Christ. But right there in the middle is a split line that says, This is zero. Now, Jesus Christ was not born on zero, he really was not. Rather, we date it to around 8 to 5 B.C. However, I don't know how they speculate this and add it up. The secular world will say that he died around 33 A.D. So, if we want to put things into actual perspective, Jesus Christ lived how many years? He lived 33, so he's going to die roughly around 28 to 33 A.D. Put a generic on it. So if, let's say he died around 28 AD, 40 years, uh, AD 40 is not that many years after that. It's only about 14 years. So these disciples are writing shortly after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's not a lot of time that's passing. They basically have time to get their information together, gather it, compile it, and write. So Matthew is not writing long after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when we look at Matthew, we need to prove that he is truly the author of the book of Matthew and no one else. And we start going down our church fathers, Arrhenius and Origen, around 130 AD, both claim that Matthew was the writer of Matthew. Apollinarius of Hyopolis, around 175 AD, states that Matthew was truly the writer of the book of Matthew. And the church historian Eusebius, around the years 260 and 340 AD, still claims and notes the fact that Matthew was truly the writer of Matthew. So we can take, without a shadow of doubt, that what Matthew penned in his book was true, and he had a direct relationship with Jesus Christ, and can say, this was truly Jesus Christ, and this is what he did. He was a true contemporary and somebody on the inside. If we look at the Gospel of Mark, 
It was written right around the same time, around 40 and 50 AD. Once again, we've already said that's not long after the resurrection of Christ. If they were going to pen a hoax and believe a lie. And if we go down supporters for the for Mark being the author of Mark, we could go through Iranians once again, around 130 and 202 AD. Clement of Alexandria, 142 to 215 AD. Tertullian, around 160 to 220 AD. Origen, around 185 to 254. And Jerome, around 347 to 420 AD. So still about 400, 350 to 400 years after the death of Jesus Christ, all these church founding fathers, these church fathers, are still saying the person who wrote that book was so and so, who they said they were, and we can certify and guarantee without a doubt that it's been passed down. We've known people that have personally known them or had direct connections connection through lineage that they were truly a contemporary Jesus Christ. They were truly a disciple. And what they saw was the truth, and that they are really, that is who is truly the author. Same thing is true the book of John. He wrote around 85 to 95 AD, a little bit later, but once again, we still have church founding fa church fathers still backing up that John was the author of the book of John. Arrhenius, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Origen, and once again, the church historian Eusebius, all unite in agreement that John was the author of John. Now, if we go step back a little bit farther, we have Luke's version of the gospel. Luke was not in the inner circle, but he was still a contemporary. He was still somebody that was alive during that time, had connections with people who were directly connected with Jesus Christ, and that's where he got his information. Just to go off on a little bit of a rap trip. Who can tell me what's unique about Luke? What sets him apart from all the other writers of the entire Bible? What? Well, he only came in later on. He came in later on, but there's one big difference. But I see one the case to uh, Saul. I don't disagree with you, brother. I'm getting back to heritage now. There's one thing that sets Luke apart from all the other writers in the Bible itself. I'm just throwing this down on the side now. Well, he also was about John the Baptist, and he was born. He did, brother. But when we look at lineage and uh, nationalities, are we Jews? No. What are we? Yeah. Luke is the only Gentile writer in the entire Bible. Out of 40 men, he is the only Gentile writer. As you said, brother, he more than likely got his information from Paul, because that's who he traveled with. He probably was not there at the crucifixion, being a Gentile. He would not have had any reason to be in Jerusalem. But he received his information from Paul, and because of Paul, he had connections to the other disciples as well. We, but Luke writes about Jesus Christ. And when it comes to the credibility of Luke, Marcion, Irenaeus, Clement, Tertullian, Origen, and the Mauritian canon all agree that the Gospel of Luke was written by Luke, and that they can verify it, and that it is true. So, when we come down to it, that's a different, Luke would have came into the picture with Paul. Yeah. But when he was going by Saul, and I don't want to get into the division of names that go into that study right now, but back then when he was persecuting the church, so, uh, Paul still knew what was going on. He there had a primary witness. He would have been at the foot of the cross. He would have seen the crucifixion. And we know that because he was part of the Sanhedrin when we actually studied that. That group that sent Christ to the cross. So when we get down to historical evidence, we can verify that the gospel writers, what they wrote was true. That they are a true primary account of Jesus Christ. That he actually existed. Those things that he did was truth. 
if we would go a little bit deeper, we would know that there were disciples present at the crucifixion, Matthew and John. As you've already said, brother, Luke probably received his account, we believe, through of Christ through the Apostle Paul because he was a physician who traveled with Paul. Mark probably received his information concerning the life of Christ from Peter. We find that in 1 Peter 5.13. If someone would please read that. 1 Peter 5.13. And someone else read Acts, 20, uh, Acts 12, verse 25. Acts 12.25. And I like when we talk about Mark, Mark was not one of the disciples. This is John Mark that we're talking about with the Gospel of Mark. But Mark received his information from the life of the life of Christ, probably from Peter. We find that in 1 Peter 5.13. Does anyone have that? So we know that Marcus was there. What about Acts 12, 25? So they took John Mark with them. So John Mark got his information for his gospel either from Peter or from Paul or possibly both. So they had direct, he had a direct connection. Now there's one thing that separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. Do you know what that is? Who can tell me what makes Christianity different from Buddhism? Judaism. Well, I hate to say Judaism because they're both combined. But Christ was crucified, died, and was resurrected. And it's not all that, to be honest, but it's rather the last part. Because Buddha died. Right. The resurrection. Because Buddha died, Tao died. You go through any other religion, all their leaders, they died. At some point, they passed away. That's, and they never came back. And they never came back. Everything for us hinges on the resurrection itself. If Jesus Christ never died, in the words of Joshua McDowell, either he was a liar, he was a lunatic, or he truly was Lord. He was who he said he was. So we have proven that Jesus Christ actually lived. That he was a real man, no matter if somebody would try to say that, well, Jesus never existed. Yes, he did. We can prove that. Historical evidence, we can go to the Gospels himself, using them just as a historical document. Jesus actually exists. There's no denying that. But the resurrection, that's a different story. Because it's interesting. Do you know that they claim that Buddha resurrected from the dead? Do you know when that theory came about? 600 years after the death of Buddha. There will be other pagan religions that claim that their god resurrected from the dead too. But do you know when that theory began coming about or when that story came about? After the resurrection of Jesus Christ. No one ever resurrected from the dead when it comes to religious leaders before Jesus Christ. Regardless of what people say, if you studied out, all those theories came about after Jesus Christ came rose from the dead. And if they began writing about Buddha rising from the dead 600 years, it's pretty fanatical that the disciples began writing about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ only about 15 years after the death of Jesus Christ. That in itself is a phenomenal fact because either they were completely lost and when somebody believed such a large line that they just said let's go big or go home and that's all there is to it. Or they held to a lie, they believed it with everything within them because we've all seen that in politicians. They squander their, the end of their life or their career believing a lie that made they build a political platform more. Or it actually happened. And when we look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the disciples were either completely out of their mind or the resurrection of Jesus Christ was truth. 
And there was no denying it. Like I've already said, eyewitness accounts, supposedly, of Buddha's resurrection came several hundred years after his birth. But when do we have the disciples proclaiming that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? When did the disciples start telling people that Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead? Way 
if they want to create a perfect hoax that they're going to have women as their first primary eyewitnesses. Because no one's going to believe it. They're all a bunch of liars. You can't believe them today. But here's the thing. When we study the Word of God and we go throughout it, even people who did not believe in Jesus Christ, they couldn't admit that it was the wrong tomb or that the tomb was not empty. We have no, but no Christian, we don't have any non-Christians in the Word of God denying that the place that Jesus Christ rested, his final resting place, was empty. None of them denied it. And that's where we get the stolen body theory from. Or I should say they get the stolen body theory from. We know it was not stolen. But when, it, when you come down to eyewitness accounts, we've all read of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have Mary Magdalene's eyewitness account in John chapter 20, verse 11. Sister Beth, would you hand this out? These two pieces out, please. Each one gets two pages. And I'll go through them quickly and we'll talk about several other things because we're running out of time. But when we look at, prior, at eyewitness accounts, when it comes to the empty tomb, everyone knew where the tomb of Jesus was. There was no denying that. But Mary Magdalene was the first to the tomb. She could testify that the tomb was empty. John chapter 20, verse 11. In fact, this is where one of my favorite uh, Easter songs come from. There's one song that we sing that's actually based on the perspective of Mary Magdalene. And it's I Come to the Guard. Uh, it's called I Come to the Guard. I don't know if was on the time. In the Garden. I come to the garden long when the dew is still on the roses. That's about Mary Magdalene's experience here in John chapter 20 when she's sitting in the garden weeping because she doesn't know where they took the body of Jesus Christ. So we know that Mary Magdalene was a primary witness that the tomb was empty. Not only that, but in John chapter 28, verses 9 and 10, we know that, quote, unquote, other women went to the same tomb and said, you know what, he's not here. We have proof in Luke chapter 24 and 34 that when Peter found out that the tomb was empty, he ran to check out for himself. So as we look at this list, it's just compiling it more, getting, getting longer and longer of a list of people who knew that the tomb where Jesus Christ was empty. We know the ten disciples according to Luke 24, 33 through 38. We have the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, 13 through 32. Thomas and other apostles, John chapter 20, 26 through 30. Seven apostles, John 21. In, um, in John chapter 21, witness that Christ was resurrected from the dead. Acts chapter 1, 4 through 9. All the apostles could testify and witness that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Peter saw Jesus alive. Then the disciples together saw Jesus alive in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 5. And if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and read it, we'll have Paul's compilation of his list of people who actually saw Jesus Christ alive after the resurrection. That's where we get in verse 6, uh, 500 people at one time. Also in the same verse, James saw Jesus Christ alive after the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 7, Paul himself saw Jesus Christ alive. We know that because if we look at, it, uh, at the life of Paul, he saw him on the road to Damascus. So when we look at this list, it just gets longer and longer and longer of people who could say, you know what? I was there. That same Jesus which I spent time with, that I knew, that I listened to, I saw him crucified, but I saw the empty tomb, and I saw him alive. The person I saw alive and walking was the exact same Jesus that I listened to years ago. The other thing that makes the resurrection account of Jesus Christ so phenomenal, especially when it comes to the disciples. Did Jesus ever tell the disciples that he was going to die? Yeah. Did 
Did he ever tell him that he was going to resurrect from the dead? Did he tell him on more than one occasion? He called, told him on quite a few occasions. But did the disciples really believe it? No. No. So if the resurrection of Jesus Christ is truly a hoax, it is created by men who, when Jesus died, really did not expect him to rise from the dead again. They had forgotten everything that he told them. And they didn't take it to heart in the first place. How do we know that? Because Peter himself, the one who was in the inner circle of Jesus Christ, did not believe that Jesus Christ was going to resurrect from the dead. And how do we know that? Because he, when they told him that the tomb was empty, he goes, yeah, I know. But rather, he ran ahead of everybody else and peeked in himself. That is not a characteristic or an action of an individual who believed that something was going to happen. If I tell Brother Eli I'm going to give him 20 bucks, and two days go by, and I walk up to the door, knock on his door, and hand him 20 bucks, he's not going to act all surprised. Brother, where is this coming from? He's expected it. I already told him it was coming. The disciples did not believe that Jesus Christ was going to rise from the dead. They didn't even know what it meant. They didn't know. They didn't even know what it meant. Did the women believe that Jesus Christ was going to rise from the dead? No. How do we know that the women didn't believe that he was going to rise from the dead? What evidence is there of that? Besides that, we can actually document proof and Jewish mentality and bring in the Gospels on how we know that the women did not expect Jesus Christ to rise from the dead. What were they doing in the tomb on that morning? Looking to see if he was, if he was in there. Uh, no, they, they weren't looking to see if he was in there. They expected him to be in there. Brother, if somebody dies, they pretty much stay where you leave them. They don't move far. Oh, I'm not going they asked, but, but brother, if you're, they were going there for a specific purpose, though. What was the purpose that they were going to the tomb? To prepare the body for burial. They were going to, quote unquote, involve them, bury them in hundreds of pounds of spices and preservatives, salts, um, myrrh. If somebody's going to rise from the dead, there's no need of spending all that money on that kind of stuff because we know that spices weren't cheap. They were going to preserve the body of Jesus Christ. Why they spend all the money to put flowers in a funeral home when you die? And you know, that's that's the waste money. That's the waste of money. You're going to buy some flowers and buy them while they're alive, not when they're dead. But we know that the women were not expecting Jesus Christ to rise from the dead because they were going in preparation to prepare the body. For the remainder of it stay there in that tomb to preserve it. And because of that, the fact that they witnessed an empty tomb is spectacular in itself. And also on top of that, we know that um, they ex didn't expect Jesus Christ to rise from the dead. And I know we need to wrap up quickly. Um, what does John chapter 20 and verse 2 state? John 20 and verse 2. Where, where, where did they first see Jesus when he was out of the tomb? Um, if you look at your Mary Magdalene experience under eyewitness, if you read that, you'll find out. Um, you're going to have to read it in your Bible, but we're just short on time, so if somebody would find 20, um, John chapter 20 and verse 2. Then she runs and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. And I won't have you read the rest of it, brother, but if you go down to verse 9, we know that they believe that the body was stolen. We don't know what happened to him. So when it comes to eyewitness accounts of the resurrection, we can go back to the disciples themselves, we can go back, their testimony is held up with primary eyewitnesses being the women, and even themselves testifying and saying, 
as much as it would make them look stupid despite the teachings of Jesus Christ, is they stole his body. What did they do with it? We come to anoint it. We come to prepare for burial. I don't know what they did with it. We have the disciples themselves actually testifying that they believe that the body of Christ was stolen. They didn't know what happened to him. They were confused. And it's not just that, but when we come to Thomas, as much as we give him a bad rap for old dying Thomas, he should have known better. None of the other disciples knew better anyhow. But when he said to him, prove it to me, prove it to me that you're Jesus. And that's when he said, touch my hand and touch my side. So even Thomas did not believe. So we have a long list of disciples who testify that the tomb was empty, that they thought the body was originally stolen. They came to prepare for burial, but it, uh, for the remainder of the stay there. When Jesus Christ presented himself to them, they still did were kind of in shock and said, oh, I don't know if this is Jesus. That's a pretty bad rap to give yourself if you're creating a theory. Whoa. Do you think he looked the same before he was resurrected? Before he was resurrected? I mean, do you think he embodied one? See, he I, don't think, I don't think he looked the same in a, in a new body. That's you, hard. You're not going to look the same either in a new body. No, I'll have more hair. Uh, I, and I'll be better I, looking, I, too. No, um, <laughs> and we don't have the time to get into this. Yeah, no hair, you need to study out um, a glorified body, what it looked like. If you study the when it comes down to it, in eternity, we're all going to be the perfect age, whatever that is. In the Jewish culture, the perfect age which for our man was 33 and a half years old. Which Jesus Christ was the perfect age when he died on the cross. So he looked very similar. Um, I do believe. Body might have looked slightly different with the pierce, maybe glowed a little bit more. Um, but we do know that the proof of the res resurrection was still there. He kept that for a witness for us. Behold my hands, behold my feet. We know that uh, whether in our perfect glorified body and every scar we ever got in this life will be removed, whatever, it really is not a big deal. But we do know that Christ kept his scars from the crucifixion when it comes to the hands and the feet as a witness and a testimony because it's not just for us. It's going to be for the Jews. Because at the end of the tribulation period, according to Zechariah, he's going to present himself to all of Jerusalem and they're going to say, where did you get those scars? Referring to the scars of the crucifixion. And he's going to say, I got them in the house of my friends. And in a day, the entire, all of Israel will believe. I think I'm going to end there for the sake of time. Any other thoughts? Any other questions? And they first, they first, Mary Magdalene was the first one to see Jesus. And, they saw, and she saw him in the garden. Okay, let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall do, continue to do, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you anoint the pastor as he brings forth your word today, anoint his mind and his lips to bring forth your word. I pray, Lord, that you anoint the song leader and the musicians, give them a special blessing as they praise you upon the string instruments, upon the vocal cords. I pray, Lord, that you anoint our hearts and our minds we plow that they would be good soil, good soil for your word to fall on, that we may remember throughout the week, but even greater than that, uh, that we would take your word and not only remember it throughout the week, but apply it to our lives that would be even farther transformed in your very image, Lord. I pray, Lord, even today that we would be in one mindset and one accord that the Holy Ghost may move as it so desires. We rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels on the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate, Lord. I pray each one of us would be on guard against the attack of the enemy, against each one of us on an individual level, and that we would push him away and rebuke him and reject him, Lord, that your spirit may have liberty in the service today. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We'll do one more lesson next week on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, proving it. And from a his, from a scientific standpoint, and then we will start back up with our series, um, becoming the Pentecostal Powerhouse. That would be up to you. That um, you.